here with book of Ephesians please glad you're here on New Year's Eve just to let you know there's no Super Bowl party here tonight and there's no parties and pandering we'll have a regular evening service at 445 I hope you'll come be with us get you home before the drunks take over the road so that you don't become a statistic. What a terrible way for those of us who remain alive to start off the new year and with a funeral of somebody that would have been better to be home than out partying. And I can assure you that that'll happen before this night is over somewhere, not because I'm a prophet, hopefully not here in Duval County, but somewhere in the United States. I can assure you that'll be a true story. I can't imagine what it is like to see how many hundreds of thousands will be gathered in Times Square to watch a ball fall. They're already gathering there, it's my understanding, and there are no uh, facilities there, so when they go there, they have to make plans on standing and staying for hours just to be able to get close enough to where the ball falls. But my heart gets smitten by that because I see a willingness on the part of the world to commit themselves to maybe as much as 12 hours or more of misery for the sake of bringing in a new year, which to them doesn't really mean anything, just another year. And you're living in a day and time that no matter how many times I warn you, Christians are hard to get to understand the significance, the importance of gathering together. I'll say this before you read the passage here. Back in 1945, right before the D-Day invasion, several people had gone to Hitler, people that were in the new and known in his intelligence section had said that there was going to be an invasion there on the beach. And Hitler was convinced of his own self and his own mind that it was going to be about 200 miles north of there. And no matter who told him, and how much information they brought him, he was completely blinded to it. Now, you can say some of that supernatural and that God did the blinding there and all that. But the illustration is this. They warned him repeatedly and he was unprepared that when all of a sudden that took place, there was no way for him to get all of his troops and all of his panzer, all of his tanks, all of the other Rommel couldn't get there. The rest of them could not get there in time to be able to thwart the attack because he had committed all of his resources a couple of hundred miles north of that. No matter how many times I tell you that in the last days, and I believe we're there, that you're going to fall under attack and the potential for you to fall out is greater now than it has ever been before. You're like Hitler in the sense you've already made up your mind. Yeah, that attack is for somebody else on some other playing field. I'm telling you, what he's trying to do is break you away from the source. Amen. And I'm trying to warn you, the attack is not coming 200 miles north of here. It's coming right here to your own personal life. And if you're not aware of that, then you find yourself ill-prepared when the attack does come. And then secondly, you can't get yourself in position to be able to repel the attack. And then oftentimes you wind up being a casualty as opposed to being prepared the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter number 5. I'll jump down to uh, verse number 17. Brother Larry's going to pray and then we're going to preach for a little while. It could be, I'm going to be aware of time or try to be, that I may have to finish this up this evening or maybe even on Wednesday because it's pretty lengthy. And can I say this? I think it's necessary, but it doesn't have the typical ring of a Sunday morning message. It'll be more like Sunday school. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. We know that He wants us to abstain from sin, to deliver us from the present evil world, to give thanks and to be in subjection to uh, the magistrates and all the laws. We know those things are laid out. So He says, don't be ignorant of those things and understand what the will of the Lord is. And then on top of that, be not drunk with wine. That means you're out of control wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That means you're under control. You see the contrast? 
Drunk with wine, I'm out of control. Being spirit-filled doesn't mean that it's equated to being drunk. A drunk is out of control. A drunk is given over to fleshly lust. Here it is the difference in being under control and being out of control. Notice, if you will, verse number 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Brother Larry, you pray, would you? And ask the Lord to help us with this. Lord, we have to thank you now for, uh, for helping us get here this morning. We thank you for this day, this Sunday morning. Lord, this place, this uh, house that we're worshiping in, and want to worship. I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. We thank you for the Holy Spirit of God. And we thank you for the Word of God. Not necessarily in that order. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for a pulpit and a preacher. A God, that we're going to hear the Word of God given to us, preached to us now. Lord, help us to, whatever it takes within us, Lord, to, we could call it a surrender or whatever it may be, or however we want to phrase it, God, that we might, we've already heard we have a free will, that we might submit ourselves, surrender ourselves to what the preacher says, the Word says, the Lord uses him to say this morning. I pray, God, you'd use the Word inside of us to work in us, the Lord, to help us, to chastise us, convict us, encourage us, whatever needs to take place, God, that we might more, more be more aligned with you, might be more in fellowship with you, or even to the soul that's lost in here this morning that may need to be saved. Yes. We ask you for help. We're going to give you all the glory in advance for what you're going to do in helping us. Might you use your man, your preacher, uh, might your power be on your word as it is, and you might use him in a mighty, mighty way to speak. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is probably one of the most understood doctrinal truths found anywhere in the Bible. I guess if I were to title the message, the message would be a control freak. The message would be under control, not out of control. The message would be the misunderstanding that when we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, while the Charismatics and Pentecostals, they tend to take that as some emotional experience. Slain in the Spirit, speaking in tongues, certain gifts that may magnify one individual over another individual. There's always this emotional thing. And then, of course, what Baptists do is, is we take it and think that when the Holy Spirit's moving, somebody's always shouting or hollering or somebody's crying or bawling or squalling. There's some outward emotion that takes place with that. That's not being filled with the Spirit. Though I have been in those kinds of meetings... But I've also been in meetings where it's been real quiet, like it was in Sunday school this morning. Nobody's shouting, nobody's uh, moving around, nobody's hustling and bustling. And you're not looking for a, you, a pew to crawl on, you're looking for one to crawl under. Right. And God's moving and instructing you, but some of those things are serious. And John, he tells us that he came here to convict the world of sin. And too often what we're doing is, is we want to ignore that portion of things and we want to say to ourselves, well, listen, I know He came to convict the world of sin, but now that I'm saved, yeah, but He never keeps, never quits convicting you of things that are wrong or improper to do. It's a life that is out of control, that is constantly under the auspices of the Holy Spirit having to spend time in correction. You've certainly known people in time that have come to church and it's like every time I come to church, I feel bad. I feel like He's getting on to me. I feel like He's yelling at me. I feel like He's pointing me out. I feel like this. Is it possible, just for the sake of our discussion this morning, is it possible that's the Holy Spirit trying to ring your bell, trying to get your attention, trying to tell you not that you're lost and you're on the way to hell, but that you're out of fellowship with God. Amen. I covered this morning, and I will not regurgitate the whole thing. Some of it came from the morning message that I was going to do. But I covered this morning that there are certain things that are occurring in your Christian life that jump out at you to say, hey, listen, you're not walking as close to God as you think you are. And certain things get pointed out here in this passage where he says to you, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, meaning I'm out of control. How many times have you heard somebody make their excuse for doing something wrong? Well, I was drunk. Well, I was drunk. 
Ma'am, let me ask you a question. If your husband came home and had he uh, committed adultery while he was out partying or out having a good time on New Year's Eve and he came home and, hey, he messed up, but he blacked out and those kind of things, would it be okay with you he was just drunk? I mean, he was out of control, right? He was under control of his own flesh, his own desires. I would imagine some of you would probably uh, be dialing 911 to help him because he's going to need rescue, right? But he makes a comparison here to something that is the opposite of that, and that's being sober to understand, but to be filled with the Spirit. That means I'm to be under control of the Holy Spirit in all aspects of my life. Now, I'm going to say to you that you're probably going to get upset because we as Christians have the tendency to yield control to certain parts of our life, but not all parts of our life. And we kind of pick and choose based upon, I guess you would call justifiable reasoning, where you come along and you sort of say, well, normally I am, but it is New Year's. Well, normally I know, but it's Christmas. Well, normally, and then there becomes a reason to go contrary to you, what God said to you. Does that make sense? I'd like to say, first of all, that it's very difficult for most of us to consider that we may be out of control this morning. I'd like to say that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is one that is peaceable and it's pure and it's easy to be entreated, but don't misunderstand, it's always under perfect control. I don't know if you've ever dealt with it before, but I want to ask you a question. Have you had the Gethsemane experience? Long before we talk about being crucified with Christ, you got to be careful when you make that kind of a statement because that took place logistically when you got saved. You were crucified with Him. But when Paul said, I die daily, Paul recognizes there is a need for me freshly every single day to endure fresh pain, to put my flesh down because it's not my will but thine be done. Unless you're asleep most days, there's going to be something in your life that is going to run contrary to what God would have you to do. And there's where the crucifixion takes place place. And the difference in an individual that is spirit-filled yields because he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So I just want to cover a couple of things here to make a suggestion to you that maybe possibly in our lives today, we're not as spirit-filled as we like to claim to be. Uh, Why wouldn't I want to be filled with the Spirit? Well, if you're filled with the Spirit, you can't do what you're doing without being under conviction for doing it. Have you ever noticed that when some people, the tank begins to run low, they begin to allow things they never allowed before? Who would ever pause rather than look at what they're doing to say, hey, you know why you're making that decision? Because the Spirit has no longer got you under control. You're driving the car. I know the song, Jesus take the wheel, or I don't know the song, I've heard the song. But you know how hard it is to yield the wheel once you start driving the car? You know how difficult it is to say, you know something, I I think I'm doing pretty good, but you know what I need to do? I need to pull over, put it in park, get out of the car, and let Him take over and let Him control things. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, by the time I'm done, you're going to think that I'm a control freak. I believe that I'm supposed to be a puppet for Jesus. And I am my own worst enemy. Yes, sir. Because when He gives me the general orders and SOPs and tells me what I'm supposed to do, I'm the one that bucks those things, not Him. I don't employ, I don't empower the Holy Spirit in my life to enable me to do what is pleasing to Him. I tend to lean toward, yield toward what's pleasing to me, up to and including defending my own reputation. Everything happening in your life right now, God knew about it before it happened. It's not a matter of could he have stopped it, could he not have stopped it. You ever pause to think this? You ever pause to think that he's seeing how you react to it? How do you respond to it? I'm glad the Lord responded the right way. I'm glad he took the beating. I'm glad he took the ridicule. I'm glad he didn't come off the cross and he could have. I'm glad he didn't call 10,000 angels. I'm glad he went ahead and died for sinners and allowed the fact that I can get saved in this age. I'm glad he was able to do that. He's not asking us anything he hasn't done himself. But he had the power without any guilt whatsoever to walk away from it. But he chose to humble himself, make himself of no reputation. And can I say this? It's in one of the verses today. Making himself a servant. Hardest difficult thing in the world. It's a whole lot harder to be a servant than it is to be the boss. 
Look, if you will, please, in the passage there, and let me ask you this question. Look in verse number 17. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Is your mind under control of the Lord? Look in Philippians chapter number 2. Do you think like God thinks? Lord knows if you spend any time nowadays with a computer, with television, with Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, and all the other kind of stuff, that, all that stuff, it's done for the purpose of changing how you think. Stalin even said years ago when he killed over 9 million uh, Jews, let alone close to 30 million of his own people, Stalin said this, if you give me America's music for about 6 to 10 years, I could take over America without firing a shot. Stalin recognized that there is a way to exercise mind control and that is to continually program, continually fill with images, with music, with words. Continue. They used to in the day call it brainwashing. And over a period of time when you begin to think that way, then when you pick up the Bible, there is such a sharp contrast that even modern day scholars cannot stand the fact that it doesn't line up with modern day theology. And so now what they do is they rewrite the Bible as if it's some sort of standard to line up with where man's standards are. God's standards never fall, but man's standards keep coming down, keep coming down. And now all of a sudden you have a non-gender specific Bible that justifies everything Thing, and all the people, nobody's a sinner. Everybody's born with a spark of good in them. The Bible says you're born dead in trespasses and sin. But that doesn't fly too well with what our mindset is, is that everybody's good. I happened to deal for years with people that weren't good. I didn't even see an innate spark of goodness in them. The only reason they ever were good to certain people was because it was to their benefit. It never was to please God. It was just I'm being good to somebody because I'm expecting something in return for that. If you found any good in them at all, it was always corrupted by the fact that that good was done for their benefit. I don't think all people have good in them. I've been in other countries and things like that and I see what other people do. I see the meanness I see the attitude toward God and toward people, and you're telling me that person has got good in them? Not without God, they don't have good in them. Look in Philippians chapter number 2, if you could, for just a moment, and look in verse number 5. Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a what? And was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. Aren't you glad he did that? Yes. You know what a person full of the Holy Spirit does? He's got a humble mind. You have that mind in you now. Romans 12 tells you in verse number 2 when he says, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, mercies of God, present your body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God's your reasonable service. But watch. Verse number 2, he says, but be not conformed to this world. That's how you think. Yep. It's not how you dress. How you dress is an outward attitude of how you think. Modest apparel is what the Bible says about dress. You say, why? Ladies, it's more so applicable to you. We'll get there in just a moment. But that's to attract attention to yourself. Can I say this? It's more to do with just clothing. Your outward appearance, the Lord never, not just from the fact that He wore a robe down to His ankles and it was white and, and all those other kind of things, a whole lot more than that, He never did things for the purpose of drawing attention to Himself. He was properly, modestly attired. He did not think it was, He thought it was robbery to be equal with God, made Himself lower than the angels, humbled Himself, and then desired to be a servant, not the master. He didn't do anything to try to attract attention. His apparel, his appearance would not be something. The Bible says he was not comely. That means he wasn't beautiful. He wasn't doing what he could to try to draw as big a crowd as he possibly could to see how many people would follow him. He's just trying to help lost people and people that were sick. But you've got to be full of the Spirit to be able to do that. The Bible says to let that mind be in you that was also in him. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. When you get saved, you get the mind of Christ. And if that's the case, I would tell you this. I would tell you that the way God thinks is contrary to the way the world thinks. And so you know what you have to do? Bring your mind into line with what God thinks. That's why some of you are considered to be weird and odd. 
And that's why some of you don't want anything to do with the Bible that we preach and the Jesus that we preach because it requires submission and subjection on your part to what God thinks. Modern churches nowadays are all about trying to let the world dictate to them what God would have us to do. No, it's not how it's supposed to be. Modern churches are supposed to do what God says to do and we're to bring ourselves in line with Him, not bring ourselves in line with the people. Listen, reaching people is not as important as staying in fellowship with God. I'll say that again because some of you look shocked. Reaching people is not more important than your fellowship with God. If your fellowship with God is what it ought to be, you will naturally attract people at the right time in the right place. You don't fool me by saying, I'm soul winning. You're living like the devil. You got things hidden in the closet. There's stuff that you're doing, but you're doing something on the outside to be seen of people so that it looks like you're more spiritual, but your tank is empty and you're bitter with everybody that doesn't show up and go sell in their street preaching or whatever it is, that you're bitter with those people because they are not doing it. It pulls the veneer off. Yes. It's I'm going to do what the Lord tells me to do whether or not anyone else does it because it's what the Spirit filled me up to be able to do. But the world says, well, that's not working out. doesn't matter if it works. It's right. The number of people does not determine the, 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 the significance, the, the validation is the word I'm looking for, but I'm using it in the wrong context. But it, it doesn't give you the crowning glory because of the number of people as to how right something is. You can't tell by the flies on an object whether or not it's a coconut cake or something out of the porty potty. The number of flies gathered doesn't determine whether one of them is edible and one of them isn't. It has to do with the Holy Spirit. There's all kind of veneers, if I might say that. There's all kind of ways to cover that up. There's all kind of ways to make it look because, see, we're carnal. We don't really know if somebody's spiritual or not. We can't look in to see what their motive is, what it is that they're doing, why it is that they're doing. The only way it does is the litmus test is how you feel about it when you don't get what you expected from God or from God's people. The mind of Christ is, I came to be a servant. You know what I do? I expect to do what I'm supposed to do, and at the end I say I'm an unprofitable servant, just what God wants me to do. Can I say this about that? You want to be careful about telling somebody else how to serve? That's between them and their boss. And you want to be careful that you think, this is what I think you should be doing. That's God's business. You let God deal with them on that. Sometimes we're in such a hurry to put somebody in the harness, and sometimes people are in such a hurry to be in the harness that they never were called to be in the harness in the first place and now they're frustrated because they're plowing in a field that God never called them to be in. And they think the problem is them. The problem's not them. The problem is submission. Are you in 1 Corinthians? Look in chapter number 2. Look down, if you will, please, in verse number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Come down to verse number 15. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. He judged things, not people. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now you may not have the mind of Christ fully and totally, but you got it in your lap. I want to ask you a question. Do you think like he thinks? How would you know if you don't read his book? Can I say this about your morals? Come back to Ephesians chapter number 5. This is something that is ever slipping. I do hear on a regular basis, but just because I hear it, it wouldn't be admissible in court and be considered hearsay. But I do hear on a regular basis, you know, preacher, don't you think it's time for the church to adapt this way and not be so hardline uh, when it comes to the morals and the moral responsibility of what the Bible says Christians should or shouldn't do? I mean, preacher, can we loosen the reins a little bit on the drinking? I've even heard him accuse Jesus of drinking. I've heard him quote the passage where Paul, talking to Timothy because of his ailment, say, have a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. I've heard him take the word strong drink in the Old Testament and try to turn that into a situation where it's justifiable for me to be able to have those things. I've heard him say that because beer is in the Old Testament, it's okay to have beer now. Forgetting altogether, let me just go back to your mind about their testimony. 
When you stop worrying about your testimony in front of other people, it is indicative of the fact that you're full of yourself, you're not full of the Lord, because the Lord was always interested in how it looked to other people. You think you can sit at the table and have that stuff poured in a glass and nobody think anything of it and then blame them for thinking they don't expect a Christian to be that way. If they do expect a Christian to be that, ladies and gentlemen, you're in the wrong group of Christians. You don't need to be around that any more than smoking crack or smoking uh, uh, cigarettes or whatever else it might be. There's certain crowds that you don't fit in if you have the mind of Christ. There's certain people that you don't fit around. You remember over there in uh, Luke chapter number 17 that even though those lepers had now been healed uh, and they were going there back to show themselves to the priest, one of them separated himself from the crowd to come back and do something so unbelievable in the Bible as to come back and say thank you that he got recognized and got made whole while the others were just healed because they did only the thing that they were supposed to do. But one of them broke out of the mold, separated himself for the crowd, and came back and got more than the other one because he had the common courtesy to say thank you. Do you know one of the ways you say thank you to the Lord? You live right according to His standard. Oh, here we go. Listen, I haven't even gotten to modest apparel and I'm not going to climb on the clothesline here. But ladies and gentlemen, there are certain things when it comes to your morals that are not supposed to fit in with the world. I don't care how far down the world comes. I don't care how dirty the church gets. There's not an excuse for a Spirit-filled Christian to be doing things that he knows grieves the Holy Spirit, quenches the Holy Spirit, vexes the Holy Spirit. But what we do is, is we make the decision to do that, and when we do... We have now unplugged or retarded, removed the ability for the Holy Spirit to empower us when the difficult things come. And you don't get to pick and choose when those things come. Listen, the devil is not stupid. He can tell when you're tired. He can tell when you're under pressure. He can tell when the things of the world are eating you up. He is watching you all the time. He is in no hurry. I don't know if you've noticed that. But all of a sudden when he sees all that, man, you would throw a 15-yard penalty on him for piling on. The second he sees that, you know what he does? He doesn't attack you because of the weakness of your flesh. He attacks you because he knows you're vulnerable according to your mind, 2 Corinthians 10. He can find a way in there and change how you... Well, if God's such a good God, why does He let that happen? If God's a should, good, such a good God, why didn't you get this? And why didn't you get that? And why didn't Santa Claus bring you this? And why didn't they do that? And they should have done this. And they should have done that. That's not God saying that. Jesus Christ did it without any expectation whatsoever. Amen. He died hoping you'd come to Him. Yes. But you know what happens? You get that opportunity. The devil comes and says, they don't care about you. They don't care nothing about you. Look at them. They're cussing you. They're making fun of you. They're laughing at you. They're mocking you. Didn't you create them? Don't you know the RNA strand, the DNA strand? Don't you know the genetic makeup of that person? Weren't you there in that little embryo when it was first implanted and born? Weren't you there? Didn't you see that baby grow up? Look at that little baby that you knew was around since the beginning and all of a sudden you see that baby up there. Look at them down here mocking and making fun. You know what Jesus answered to that? that is, to the devil and to the rest of the world. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Not, how dare them accuse me? You say, why? He's full of spirit. He's all God. Isn't that what you expect of Him? Well, what if He were to expect that of you? The manifestation of the Spirit is how you treat other people and how much in line you are with Him. You want to be filled with the Spirit? It requires some discipline, ladies and gentlemen. You have to make an effort. In Ephesians 4, he says, Let all bitterness be put away from you with all evil speaking. Don't tell me that your mouth is not supposed to be under control of the Holy Spirit. If you're out of control, your mouth is out of control because your heart's as black as a... dirty. You say, why is that? Out of the abundance of the heart. Preacher, everybody get... Stop, 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 stop making excuses. When you go to see the doctor, you don't spend all your time with the doctor. When he tells you you got COVID or a cold or cancer, you don't spend all the time with the doctor saying, well, I must have caught it from so-and-so. Well, so-and-so has it. I guess I caught it from them. Well, you know, they are going to those places, and I didn't went to the place. The first time I go, I got sick. If I hadn't have followed them, you know what you do? Okay, doc, I know I got a cold. Can you give me some medicine? 
You don't sit and blame other people, but spiritually, can I say this? You blame other people for your own downfall. He has given you the ability to do all things. The only reason you don't do the all things is you're not filled with the Spirit and you don't want to be. You're happy right where you are. There's such a good balance between you and the world and how it just kind of feels good. I'm not convicted anymore about certain things. i got such liberty to do whatever I want to do. Where in the Bible did you get that? That you have liberty to do what you want to do and that it involves shackles. No, it requires restraint. It requires recognizing that your own worst enemy is the one you were born with. It's not other people. Look, if you will, please, back in the book of Ephesians here, I'd like to say this, our morals have to be under control. Look in verse number, oh, make it 11. I have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? Now, how do I do that? How do, how do I walk with the Lord? Can I show you? It's in verses 1 to 5. This is expository. It's not a matter of you coming in and just getting rid of a bunch of things. Let me correct that right now. Let me say to you that what you're fixing to see is morals are instilled by... It begins with a walk in love. If I learn to walk with Jesus, guess what? The other things will take care of themselves. You say, how do you know? It's in the Bible. Would you care to see what it says? Can you just check your attitude and your idea for a moment? And let's let the authority speak. The Bible says in verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Are you a dear child of God? So he said, follow him. Not follow the preacher. Not follow a mentor. Follow him. You say, why? Following any human being, no matter how great they may be, there's always a fallacy. They're a human being. And whether they intend to let you down or not, they're a human being. And the potential is they can let you down. Notice in verse number 2, "...and walk in love as Christ hath loved us and hath given Himself an offering, a sacrifice uh, to God, uh, to God, a sweet-smelling savor." So guess what happened? Before he starts listing the things in the next few verses of stuff we shouldn't do, guess what he says? Walk in love. My ability to overcome the things of the flesh, my moral compass is set by walking with God. I don't agree with the whole movement, but I do agree with the idea behind WWJD. What would Jesus do? I would have to say, in a lot of cases in my own personal life, not what I was doing. If you were to say, what would Jesus do? I could say exactly opposite of what I'm doing. I'm no better than you. I'm not talking down. I'm not being condescending. I'm saying that we are anemic spiritually and there is no way for you to stem the tide of what is coming in 2024 with the onslaught of demonic activity and the devil are running hordes of things to try his best to get you out before the horn blows and we get out of here. There is no way for you to overcome that if you don't realize that when it comes to the Spirit, we need to be full every day. Amen. Amen. But we don't have that desire. And our morals begin to slip and we start uh, thinking of different things. And you know what we say? Well, preacher, you know everybody else does it. He says in Colossians 3, mortify your members. He says in Romans 6, that whoever I yield my members to, his members they are to obey. I realize that what he says clearly is, is that the devil can still have control of my hands if I let him. He can have control of my feet if I let him. He can't touch my soul, but he can have an entrance way into every part of my body and do all five of my senses. He can't touch my sixth sense. But he can sure, because of all these other five, these five kings that are running me, ruling me, he can sure prevent this one from having the power it needs to overcome those things because I grieve him with this, I vex him with this, I quench him with this. That power is in our hands. Because when it comes to our morals and our moral compass, there are certain things. Can I say this? You're going to take some hits for it. If you choose to do what's right to do, I'm going to offend some of you now. It is unintentional, but it is unequivocal. There is no question it is going to occur. Shacking up is still wrong. I don't care how many people do it. 
boys and girls coming together outside of wedlock as old fashioned and ill gotten as that sounds it's still wrong to do that and you can't be a Christian filled with the Holy Spirit and allow those things into your life not by just doing them but by condoning them no hey they live in my household that's your business but when they're out there on their own you can't condone it you say why hey there's a whole lot in the Bible about those things your testimony does matter. Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. And I hate to say this, but a lot of Christians nowadays have the morals of, the, of an alley cat. Amen. Probably none of you that's at least my age or a smidgen younger doesn't remember that there was a very famous evangelist, TV evangelist. He could play and sing. Uh, he had kinfolk, Mickey Gilly, and, and uh, Great Balls of Fire, Jerry Lee Lewis, and all that stuff. And when he messed up with a prostitute, of course, he didn't lose his salvation. Everybody else lost theirs, but that damnable Baptist doctrine. But can I say this to you? Uh, what people didn't realize was is that all of a sudden it's like, well, you know that had been going on for years? before he was caught, and everybody was aghast. But in churches nowadays, your sons and your daughters, your grandkids, it's like, well, it's still wrong. And, and But I'm telling you, you're going to take a hit. Well, I know, but that's my... Oh, okay, but it's still wrong. Is there a way to make that statement without condoning what they're doing? I just don't want them to feel comfortable about it. Homosexuality is still wrong even if it is in your family. I'm sorry that it's in your family, but it's still wrong. Doesn't make you worse than anybody else, but can I relieve you a little bit? Doesn't mean you were a bad parent. It doesn't mean you did something wrong. It means they chose to use their free will to do something that according to God is contrary to Scripture and they choose of their own choosing, their own free will to make that decision but you don't have to condone it just because, well, that's my child. Whoso loveth mother, father, sister, brother, husband, wife, children, yea, his own life also, didn't say couldn't be saved, cannot be my disciple. Amen. Your morals, the things have begun to slip even in churches today where the off-color joke has found its way into the congregation. Right. Yep. The off-color text, the, the, the things that have come out uh, every now and then, and I don't mean always sexual in nature, I just mean to just at someone else's expense. Sure. Some of you with what you put out on the internet and social media, if you were in public school, you'd be charged with bullying. Bullying. Oh in the local independent Baptist church because your fingers do the walking and the talking. And before long, your moral compass is gone astray and then your life winds up being a shipwreck because, hey, if it's okay for them, why not it's okay for me? The fear is, is the next generation. My, not, my time's almost done. I'm almost out. What's going to happen behind me? Worse yet, what's going to happen behind grandkids and great-grandkids? If you don't hold the rope, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, part of being empowered by the Holy Spirit is the ability to say, that's not right and I'm not doing it. I'm not going to put wine and liquor and stuff in my shopping cart and go through the thing because it's Christmas and everybody else does it. Can I say this? Come, if you will, please, over to First Timothy chapter 2. Our minds need to be under control. Is that a fair statement? Yes, Our morals should be under control. Do you realize that back in the day that uh, churches were known for setting the standard, the living standard for morals in America? Did you know that? In America. Long before all of the ne'er-do-wells as far as presidential and gubernatorial candidates, they went and pandered themselves to churches because they realized that the church was what set the standards for what the morals should be in America. Then there was a guy that was up in Lynchburg and he started doing this thing called the moral majority, majority and he made an abortion of the whole mess. Because while he's doing all that kind of stuff, he's backhanding stuff with politicians and his son's involved in all kind of things. But let me say this to you. No matter how bad they have corrupted it, the church should still set the standard when it comes to moral behavior. That doesn't mean you're not welcome if you've been in jail, if you've been in prison, if you've been married 15 times, if you've had a whole bunch of women or a whole bunch of men or whatever it might be and you've been a drug addict or a drunk. That Don't take that, oh, well, that means I, they're, they're too good for me to come there. No, we're here for whosoever will. 
and God will take you like you are. But at some point, can we kill the behavior? I mean, at some point, don't you check that behavior when you go get a job? You know what's amazing to me is we get accused sometimes of having the bar too high and yet if you've been convicted of a felony, there are certain jobs you can't even apply for and you can't get a gun permit and you can't vote because of what you did. But if the church there says, hey, you know what, maybe you might want to consider what you did was wrong and own it. Oh, well, we're just too tough. Well, then go to the charismatic church. You say, why? There, I should not run the risk of corrupting the clean people by letting one or two of them in because I'm worried about popular opinion. Right. I've already been warned. You're never going to fill up that building with that standard. Okay? Okay. Uh, okay. I, I'm, I'm all right with that. Do you, do you understand? I'm okay with that. Yeah, but why did you do that? Because he said to do it. It's his job to finish it and his job to fill it. It's not my job to compromise in order to fulfill what I think he wants me to do. You need to grab a hold of that. I'm not, I'm not concerned. Well, what's everybody going to think? What's God going to think? He thinks you built what I told you to build and, or he built it or, but anyway, you did that and rapture happens or I die. Good. Somebody else can take it. My mind is not bent on success in the world's eyes. That is a money issue. The love of money is the root of all evil. I have to guard against that. I told you very openly just a couple of weeks ago, God has always used that to control me. If it's not there, you don't do it. That's for manpower and that's for money. When the money comes in, we apply it where it's supposed to with the right biblical principles and the right men amen in it, and we move forward. And when the money stops, I don't know why it stops. God said it stops. Good. What do we do? We stop. No, we gotta, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to put out pledge cards, we need to do so on and so forth. I ain't doing it. Well, I mean, what happens if it sits there? It sits there. We're doing okay, right? You say, well, it's kind of crowded. Okay, we'll turn the air conditioner on. Take your jacket off. Loosen your tie. Kick off your shoes. Relax. It'll be all right. Yeah, but preacher, I mean, we were crowded so much in here, and then all of a sudden you started really cranking it up again, and now we don't have to put chairs out anymore. Good. Let's make more room for you. I mean, you asked for the Lord to uh, increase your borders like Jabez, and some of you he did over the Christmas holidays. You need a little more room, don't you? Quit worrying about that. Here's what happens. It becomes manipulative. That little comment, whether you recognize it or not, it has an impact on me. And it makes me ponder and it makes me think, And am I, am I too far that way? Am I a little too harsh? Am I a little too strict? Am I a little bit... I got, Listen, I, I'm thinking to myself, hey, you better watch it. I check myself. I want to see it explode. I want to see a thousand people. Whether it makes you uncomfortable or not, I don't care. I want to do what God wants me to do. But it makes me pause. It's manipulative. Well, you know, preacher, I mean, I brought a friend of mine to church the other day. My Lord. And you had to go off like a scud missile and you were screaming and yelling and hollering. and, And I'm not saying it wasn't good, preacher. I'm just saying, of all times, why that time? I don't know. Because I saw you brought a visitor and I was trying to run him off. (laughs) Hey, if you're a visitor, I'm glad you're here. But you know what I believe? I believe it's a divine appointment. I still believe in that. I believe that what He gave me to say to you today is for you that are here today. I believe God had a real... Whether you come back or not, I believe what God has for me to say, He's got something in there just for you. I don't think I'm just up here running my mouth as mad as some of you are and as under conviction as some of you are. Rather than submit to what God would have you to do, you'd rather be empty instead of filled. You sure would be glad to be filled if you were preaching next. First Timothy chapter number 2, it ain't just always the women. Look in verse number 9. Would you agree that our modesty needs addressing? Can I say this before you jump on it? Modesty is more than just apparel. Modesty has to do with how you think. I'm worn out and 
few times that I go places to travel, and sometimes, especially during the holidays, there's something about a woman uh, uh, saying inappropriate things and using certain words. There's something about that that it just trips my trigger. It's like something that's pure and clean and innocent and a weaker vessel, and now they're, you're talking like a bunch of men. You say, what is that? You're filled with something and it's not the Spirit. I'm not trying to be crass. I'm just saying modesty also has to do with the attitude, the billboard on your face. 1 Timothy chapter 2, look in view, please, in verse number 9. Give me just a few moments here. And like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, shamefaced sobriety, not with bordered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Oh, preacher, you're telling me I can't wear jewelry? God help you, please wear some. <laughs> you're telling me I can't wear makeup? Hey, every barn needs a little paint. <laughs> Cover up them crow's feet. I mean, thank God it was invented and makes you look younger than you really are. I mean, I realize you got to prepare your husband for the big shot, you know, at nighttime, and you get and take all that stuff off, and he's like, oh, hey, honey, I don't know who this is in here. She goes, it's me. And you heard about the guy who fell in love with the opera singer, and man, I mean, she was just something to hear, and, and so he married her, sent her flowers and all that, and they courted a while, dated a while, and they wound up getting married, and he woke up after the honeymoon, and he looked over there, and there's teeth in the glass over there, and there's a wig over there, and false eyelashes over there, and then he looked down there at her, and he said, sing something quick, honey, sing something quick. <laughs> Don't turn this into making yourself a, some kind of a legalistic fool or a prude. It's always something about why it is that the women get magnified here. This is both for men and women. Mod modest apparel means that you're not trying to attract attention to yourself. Wife beaters and clothes that are too tight. And while the woman might wear breeches that are too tight, the man will wear a shirt that's too tight because he's lost 10 pounds and been working out for a week. And in his mind, he's got a pump for the first time in his life. And he thinks he's Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's like, hey man. And, and if that's what you use to attract a guy or a girl, your relationship is going to be just that. Notice this. There's a couple of things I just want to, to draw attention to. I, I would like to say this. Here's the temptation. Our temptation is, is to attract attention by how we dress. Number two, I would like to say right in the passage, look in verse number 11. Our temptation is, is that we refuse to be in submission even if it involves our conduct. Here it's dealing with the women. Ma'am, can I just give you a word of caution? That's what got Eve in trouble. Our problem is, according to verse number 11, is, is that we have the tendency in verse number 12 to talk back and argue with authority. Well, now before you make this all about the women, some of you women look like you're going to throw up. You had not even had lunch yet. It is about the women here, but aren't you the bride of Christ? Amen. Come on, preacher. Yeah, yes, there it is. How's your apparel? Yep. That's good. Before you make this all about a husband and wife relationship, how is it then when it comes to these kind of things that you have a problem with submission? Don't you have a tendency to argue with authority? I don't hear women getting up and arguing about governmental authority. I don't hear women getting up and arguing about uh, don't, don't sign the ticket if the guy gives you a ticket and all that. I hear men doing that. Men have as big a trouble with this as other ones do. Can I give you another one in verse number 14? Our tendency is to get depressed and complain uh, when, we, uh, when it comes to talking about our children. Children don't always turn out how you want them to. You can't realize what I'm saying here maybe, but that infringes on God's ability to give someone a free will. And at some point, your kids are no longer dealing with you and it's no longer representation of what you did or didn't do raising them. It has to do with them and their relationship with the Lord and they're accountable to Him, not you. Park your reputation. And anybody that tells you that it was your fault, park them. Last of all, in verse number 14, not last of all, any of that. Ladies and church, it's easy to be deceived by Satan. You see that in the passage? Ma'am, you're more likely to be deceived than the man is. Come back to Ephesians chapter number 4. I'll just give you this one while you're turning. 
Can I ask you a question? Should our mouths be in control? Just go right on to Ephesians chapter number 4 and watch the power of the mouth. Did you realize you can stop His mouth with yours? Look in Ephesians chapter number 4 and look what He says in verse number 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth unless you have good reason. What do you think the word no means? I could ask Dr. Noble, but I think it means none. I think that's without exception. That means zero. Can you find for me a place where Jesus Christ had corrupt communication? You know what he says in other passages of these evil communications corrupt good manners. Now, if I haven't gotten you up to this point, surely right now you're on the hook. He said no corrupt communication. But then he follows that. If you look at the sentence structure, there's not a period there. It's not standing by himself. But doesn't he say, but that yeah. conjunction, right? But in that conjunction, right? Okay. But that which is what? Good. And what? Good. Is that what comes out of your mouth? I don't have a problem being edifying to people I like. Piece of cake. Right? But if I'm not supposed to let corrupt communication come out of my mouth, I better first not only check that, but I better make sure I'm also following the other part of that, that if I'm going to talk, as my mama used to say, if I don't have something good to say, then it's better not to say anything at all. Yes, my mama drilled that in me. I wish I'd learned it. I don't think, not that my mom's a saint, but pretty close to it, but I don't think I ever remember my mom talking bad about someone else. I can call a number of times where my mom said, well, you know, we're all sinners and you know people make mistakes and this and that. It's like, mom, you're defending the devil. <laughs> the joke used to be around our house, well, you know how your mama is, she'd find something good to say about the devil. Well, that's a pretty good reputation. Yeah. But can I say this? We need to learn to realize and to understand that our mouth is a part of what's going on in our heart. Our talk grieves the Holy Spirit. We're talking about being filled with Him. Now listen to me. Okay? This is important. You can't be filled and grieve Him at the same time. You can't be filled and quench Him at the same time. If you make the choice to grieve Him, that means to willfully sin, quench Him, that means to be disobedient to His will for your life. If you make that decision, the tank comes down, you're not filled with the Spirit. You're out of fellowship with the Spirit. Still going to heaven, still sealed to the day of redemption, but all of a sudden it's been sequestered. Watch what it does. Look in the verse number 30 right there. Doesn't He say, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed to the day of redemption? Look at the source of the corrupt communication. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. A lack of kindness. A lack of forgiveness. Can I pull over and park for a minute? There's a little bit more to grieve in the Holy Spirit if you don't consider the source of where all that comes from. The Lord said there's something inside you that is causing this to take place. A lack of kindness and be ye kind. When you're not kind, grieves the Holy Spirit. Oh, I'm not bitter preacher. I don't have evil speaking and clamor and all that. Are you kind? Are you kind? Are you forgiving? Sir, ma'am, when you have an argument, are you famous for bringing up past things to bolster your argument in the present? Are you forgiving? You just grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that you need to be able to overcome whatever opposition you're in, have you just now grieved Him because you don't know how to be kind? It takes effort to be kind. I don't have any problem being kind to people I care about. Being kind requires me to overlook sometimes. You have to be kind to people that aren't kind to you. Not easy. People will have certain things to say and they lay you low and that kind of a deal. So what do you do? Can you be kind? Let them grieve the Holy Spirit. Why should you grieve it just because they did? It takes effort to be kind. It takes effort. Some of you, can I just say this? 
it really honestly would not hurt you. We're not in COVID anymore. It would not hurt you to get up from where you are and just go speak to a couple of people and say, hey, how are you doing? It's nice to see you here today. I'm not talking about asking for their social security number and take them out to lunch. But you come late and you leave early because you don't like people. You grieve the Holy Spirit. Be you kind one to another. How can you be kind to people that you don't ever get around? Well, I'm, I'm kind to the people. I, I, I don't really like people. Where's that in the Bible? The world would be a great place if it wasn't for people. Yeah, but it's about people. You're a people. That's what He died for. Right, right, right. And then forgiving. There is nothing worse than to have to constantly live with the scarlet letter A on your head and to know that every time that an argument transpires, he or she is going to bring up your unfaithfulness even though they said they're working on trying to fix the relationship. But the bigger issue, ladies and gentlemen, is not what you do to the person. It's what you do to the Holy Spirit. Do you even care? I'm not giving you opinion. I'm giving you Bible for everything I've said. I'm talking about grieving. Oh, we talk about the bitterness and wrath and anger and the clamor and all that all the time. But what about the kindness? You mean when I'm not kind, I'm grie- you're grieving the Holy Spirit? What if I'm not forgiving? You're grieving the Holy Spirit. That'd be a great place to have an altar call. You say, why? I don't know how many of us would be guilty, but I would say quite a few. Come to Ephesians 5 real quick. Let me try to close this up. I have to be under control as I started off the message of the Holy Spirit. Not out of control with my own way of doing things. When I'm not allowing Him to control me, it's as if I have partaken of my own imbibement as far as drinking is concerned, and I've chosen to do what I want to do under the influence of alcohol as opposed to being controlled by the Spirit. Make no mistake about it, the Christian life is one of absolute control. His control. You needn't expect God to call you to some field, some place to do something if you can't get these things down pat. He can't trust you with the discipline necessary to stay in fellowship with Him. Across the board, we apply that, do we not? When it comes to work or whatever, somebody steals from you at work, you're like, oh, well, hey, it's, uh, it's all in one pot. You're, it's good. Not, you know what they are? They're a thief. You brand them, you put them out, right? How many times have you stolen His glory? How many times have you made it so much about you that the Holy Spirit can't even be manifested? Ephesians chapter number 5. I just want to touch this one real quick. He says this in verse number uh, 19. I'm using M's if you can't tell. Uh, We need to make sure that our music is under control. Psalms, hymns, spirituals, making melody in your heart. You know what it's hard to do? It's hard to sing when you're unhappy. What kind of music you think he's talking about there? Country? I mean, we know it's not headbanging music. But you know, heaven ain't a lot like Dixie. And you know, a country boy, he can survive. And the Beach Boys just sing songs about She's real fine, my 409. And the little surfer girl. And it's funny how those trip your trigger and bring back those memories of when you were doing fleshly things. Walk in Walmart and hear a song and it's like, how did I know I knew those words? When was the last time that when you heard the sound of amazing grace or you heard praise the Lord for full salvation, it took you back and said, man, I remember when God did this for me. I remember when God did this for me. You hear these youngins get up here and sing all of them. we got some of the most talented people you've ever seen in the world that are right here. And you know what they're doing? They're not entertaining you. They're ministering to you. When's the last time that tripped your trigger and you said, you know something? When's the last time you went to that well instead of the other one when you get out of fellowship with the Lord? Don't tell me you don't go in there and turn on your Sirius XM and push the button and go to 
latest, greatest, or 70s and 80s or whatever is out there. Well, preacher, how do you know about all that? Because I know what's out there. I know that the tendency is that he wouldn't have put that in the Bible if he didn't know that we as Christians don't have the Holy Spirit's control in our music. You condone it. One lady told me, she said, Preacher, I just listened to that easy listening stuff. I said, well, okay, sister, could I just ask you a question? Can you read your Bible and listen to it? Before she even thought, you know what she said? Heavens no. And, I, and then she was like, oh, I mean, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, sis, I don't want to know, but where's your mind when you're listening to it? A much happier time. You mean before life caught up with you? You had to have a job. Mom and dad weren't paying the bills. You had to go to work. You had children. You have Christian responsibility. You mean those times? Well, you know, yeah, back in the day stuff. You know what we need to learn to do? Uh, Lord, if it doesn't exalt you, magnify you, if I can't listen to this and read my Bible, I just probably should not be listening to it. Preacher, you're a prude. No, you do whatever you want. I'm just telling you, for me, that conjures up things I'm better off not remembering. It conjures up images when I listen to the lyrics that I wasn't even aware of. My wife and I, not long ago, we thought, hey, you know, there's a couple of I Love Lucy reruns, you know, the funny lady, Lucille Ball. I didn't know she was a stripper. I didn't know all that stuff. And so I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh, I love Lucy. That must be good. I never saw it. Ricky Ricardo with cigarettes and liquor. And he played the, the, uh, uh, the, the little funny shape thing, bongo things. Isn't that what they call them? Is that right? He played that in a, in a bar and a dance club. I never, I never even saw that as a kid. I thought, I love Lucy. What could be wrong with that? And listening to her and how she talked to Ricky and how her and the lady that lived somewhere close to him were always trying to do something contrary to Ricky and Fred and getting in all kind of trouble. I didn't, I, I didn't realize that. And now I look at that and I'm like, man, how could that be bad? I've even seen it on Andy of Mayberry. Amen. One of the main stars of that thing was Otis the Drunk. Yeah. Yeah. He had to stay in jail, but you know they left the jail cell open for him because we understand, you know, no church in there, no God in there. Little liquor finds its way into the the script every now and then. I know I'm kicking your God, some of you, but you have to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible specifically says, in order for me to stay in fellowship with the Spirit. I gotta have the right kind of music. That's why we're funny about music here. You say you're to the extreme. Okay, go to somewhere else. We're gonna keep being to an extreme. I don't think I should have to have it approved. I don't care. I, I do know what I'm doing when it comes to that. Well, you know as much as okay, when you're the pastor or when you would take over and you're you can do what you want to do. I'm not doing it. You're not gonna see a bunch of drums sitting up here. And preacher, that place over there is big. We got room for a drum set and all that kind of stuff. You're smoking crack. I'll fill it with plants. There won't be no drum set up there. I mean, we'll, it'll look like a stinking forest. Epping Forest will have nothing on us. That will be Epping Bible Believers Baptist. What is that? That's the jungle. That's the redwood forest. Those are cedar trees and redwoods. There ain't going to be no drums over there. So if you're thinking that, you just well put the crack pipe down. It ain't happening. You say, why? I had to submit my music to the Lord. Amen. You're musically talented. You have a gear other people don't have. You have something God gave you as a gift that you can see, do, and create things that other people don't see, do, and create. You need to recognize God gave you that gift like He gave David the ability to play a harp and to be a blessing writing the Psalms. And you need to recognize everybody doesn't have that ability, and you need to make sure that that's, that gift doesn't run away with you. Amen. Because before long you'll take that guitar, and then you'll be doing a couple of little riffs, or you'll be taking the horn, or you'll be taking the violin, and then before long it'll go away with you. 
The devil's been down to a lot more places than just Georgia. First Timothy chapter number 6, Just let me just give you this real quick. Notice what he says, giving thanks always of all things. In 1 Timothy chapter number 6, he says, the love of money is the root of all evil. The people that are there believe that gain is godliness and, and they will be rich, rich and they don't utilize what God's given them to distribute to the necessities of God, not just to their own necessities. We're talking about submission. There's no better way for you to check. Now, just, just check your attitude before I say this, okay? I'm not trying to bilk you out of money. But there is no better way to check your spirituality until at the end of the year you check and you see where your investments are. And if there's not a portion, whatever the portion is that God's given you to do, if there's not a portion that went to Him and His causes, you're out of balance and there's no way you can be filled with the Spirit because He gave you repeatedly. And i got ten verses up here and I'm not going to run them now. I'm simply saying, God gives it to you. What do you do with it when He gives it to you? I'm not saying if you give it to Him, He'll give it back to you in a bucket. You know, you throw it up in a spoon, He'll give you it in a shovel. I'm not making a promise. He may not give you anything. I'm just saying it's right to do. Amen. You can't really tell unless you're willing to invest in something you can't see. Right. And if you come to the end of the year, it's between you and, and the treasurer, I guess, but it's between you and God. You give as God prospers you. No guilt monkey, no nothing. Sometimes He prospers you more in a year than He does in another year. The issue is, am I investing in what God would have me invest in when it comes to missionaries, when it comes to school, when it comes to doing the things that God wants to do, whether it's a building or whether it's supporting somebody that needs some assistance as far as life is concerned. I'm saying that it needs to be ask God, what do you want me to do with this? We're talking about not being out of control. A fellow said one time to the old preacher, let me give you just one more. Can you give me can I do that? I know I'm I'm ten minutes late. Just uh come to Second Corinthians chapter number three. He came to the old preacher one time and he said, Hey preacher, I want to ask you a question, you know. He said, Okay, what's that? He said, uh, let's just say, you know, I play the lottery, and uh let's say I win the lottery. And the preacher said, Okay, and he said, uh, suppose I win a million dollars. And I come to you and I tell you, hey, I won the lottery and I won a million dollars. And I want to tithe off that million dollars and give $100,000 to the church. He said, what would you say about that? Without even hesitating. I was standing right there, without even hesitating. You know what he said to him? He said, young man, if you don't give a dime off of a dollar, you're not going to give 100000 off a million. If you're not giving before you get it, you ain't going to give it when you get it. And he walked off. That guy was like, what do you call it? Gobsmacked. And he was like, because what the preacher did was called him out. You're planning on giving when you get. That's contrary to what the Bible is. I'm giving because I God's prospered me. I'm giving as much as I can. What do I have? What I got? You get hung up on amounts. It's not about amount. The Lord looks at a woman, gives two mites, says, hey, that woman really putting something in the plate. She gave all she had. Does that mean I have to give all I have, preacher? No, you have to give as God's prospered you. That's between you and God. I can't tell you how much to give. There's liberty in that. God loves a cheerful giver. I'm never going to put on a mask and get a gun and hold it to your head and tell you God's going to kill you if you don't give. That's not a cheerful giver. That's embezzlement. That's blackmail. That's robbery. I've heard the verses. Malachi 3.10 Will a man rob God? What? I'm not robbing God. I can't rob God. I'm saved. I'm in this age. I give as God's prospered me or not. I'm not judged like they are in the Old Testament that if I don't do it in the Old Testament, He doesn't allow the rain and the sunshine to come on my crops and so I'm not able to give the crops that need to be there to take care of the Levitical priest. I'm not under that thing. I don't have to even worry about that. But boy, you've sure had it put on you. Look, all I have to do is, is to find out I'm coming to an end now, but the icing on the cake is, is that everything I've said, it doesn't really catch you until all of a sudden it's like, okay, well what about that money? You know what that money represents? It represents security to some of you. And you think that if you have it, that makes you secure. You can be out of fellowship with God and not filled with the Holy Spirit and have a million dollars sitting in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. And according to God, what good did that do you? You're trusting it, not Him. Right. Yeah. Giving shows that God's alive. 
and that He means something, and that you recognize that. It's an opportunity, not that you have to, but that you get to. If you don't want to, no problem. I'm not going to say anything to you. He doesn't tell me what people give. So don't worry about it. It might be easing over on your wallet. <laughs> but I could say this to you, for me personally, after all God's done for me, like you heard Brother Sam say, I'm in the rears. Yeah, yes. Preacher, don't you give 10, 20, 30, whatever does it make? I'm in the rears. I could get everything that I get from now till I'm dead and I'm in the rears. But I know this, I know when the Lord says, hey boy, Lord, you, you give me a chance to do... Okay. How much? You know what he says sometimes? All of it. So what do you do? Okay. See, you're nervous. It's not, well, can I keep some back? God, I got Ananias and Sapphira in trouble. <laughs> How can I say I'm fully committed and filled with the Spirit if when He gives me an order, I disobey it? You know, for all the right reasons. I know you need to go, but I need to cover this last one if I could, please. Are you in 2 Corinthians? I'd like to say this in verse number 17. 2 Corinthians 3, look in verse number 17. I'm not the one I'm looking for. What I'm going to tell you is this. Uh, we have a responsibility to make sure that whatever ministry the Lord's given us, that's it. Now the Lord is that Spirit. That's it. Where the Spirit of the Lord is at liberty, but we with an open face beholding, that's it, and the glass of the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image, glory to glory, even as the Spirit of the Lord. Therefore, seeing we have this, see it, ministry, as we have received mercy, we what? You don't quit. A fellow said to me recently, I'm going to retire. This is that going to be Michelin, Goodyear. Re retire. Well, you can retire from your job at work, but where do you retire from being a Christian? What does that mean when you retire? You're going to go on a permanent vacation? You not go to church anymore? You've already done your stint? You've done your time in the military? Where, where, where is that? But this ministry, our ministries have to be committed to the Lord, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craft, just handling the Word of God deceitfully, manifestation of truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience. Let's read that again. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of who? But if our, con if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world have blinded the minds. Can I say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? I have to do what the Bible says to do according to what God says. And I have to recognize in that verse passage, I've been given a responsibility or a ministry, and because of that, I don't get to quit. Quit should not be in my vocabulary if I'm a Bible believer filled with the Spirit. And I'll be honest with you, it's not always easy. Can I be honest with you, there are plenty of opportunities if you get your eyes off of Him to justify quitting. The older you get, the more tempting it becomes because you don't do as well dealing with the conflict. You, you don't do as well as you did when you were a young buck. When you, do, and when, you, when you get old, it hurts more. You see it as a challenge when you're younger, but it hurts as you get older. But you know what he said? Seeing we have this ministry, we faint not. You have people that are dependent on you. It's not just a preacher in the pulpit. Not just for Sunday school teachers that have kids. Not just for nursery workers. This is for all Christians. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God and our ministry needs to be under His control, not your own control, not your own ideas, not your own thoughts, not your own way of doing things. That ministry has to be under His control, but the temptation, chapter 4, verse 1 is, is to be so overwhelmed with whatever ministry God gave you that you say, you know what? I'm done. Paul says, we faint not. Why? You didn't put yourself there. God put you there. Amen. So quitting is off the table. Amen. Aren't you glad Paul didn't quit? Yes, sir. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't quit? Yes, sir. Aren't you glad Peter fixed it and didn't quit? Yes, sir. How about Moses? How about David? Better Amen. still, what about you? Amen. You'll not make it to the end of this thing called the Christian life 
without being filled with the Holy Spirit. You won't make it. You'll be saved. You'll still be in heaven. But you'll become a statistic. You'll be sitting at your house in a living room hoping to regurgitate or restart something that you used to have maybe possibly way back in the day and way back when. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll not make it without being filled on a regular basis. But there's a big responsibility that comes with that. It's being in subjection. It's being in submission. It's being surrendered to Him and saying, Lord, not my will, but Thine be done. Heads are